Hey there, it is Irene Lyon. Welcome to this Q&A today in December. What day are we today? December 12th, 2019. Um, I want to just say for you here watching the recording, um, which is probably happening right now if you're watching this right now, we're waiting for people to get on live and on the line. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being interested in this work. If Anything is covered today that is still not answered for you, please continue to search my resources, my videos on YouTube, my blog posts on my site. Also know that um, my support team can help you out if there's something that you're still a bit confused with. And of course, if you want to continue to do the work from a practical point of view, getting into the work, getting into the real nitty gritty, the way to do that will be through one of my online programs, which are all on my site, irene.com, or working with a somatic practitioner um, that I will suggest you search for and find either in your area or virtually online. So there's lots of ways that you can do this work. So hello, hello. Let me know maybe where people are coming from. I see um, Cynthia from Ontario. We've got about 10 people going here and we'll probably get some more as we get going. Now, I wanted to start off by doing kind of a basic overview of, not basic, it's complex, but answering the question, what is nervous system regulation? So what is nervous system regulation? And I was just talking to somebody about this literally an hour ago and talking about how, for example, I have got 16 pages of questions here. If we were to have done this a little while ago, five years ago, we wouldn't have had the same interest. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One, I've been around a little bit more, so you're curious, you know that this stuff exists. And I also think that we all are, as a collective, moving forward. And this is how humanity works. We move forward, even though we sometimes feels like we're moving backwards, whatever is occurring, we are moving forwards and we're learning more. We're discovering more. And if we think back, for those of us who were around in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were always the next, there was the next trend. In the 80s, it was about aerobic fitness. And then in the 90s, we understood that we needed to do weight training and resistance training to keep our muscles and bones strong. 2000s, we were getting more into food and nutrition, um, learning more about phytochemicals and all these micronutrients that are in foods that are important for our systems. Now as we're getting towards this, this time of 2020 and moving forward, we are realizing that the nervous system stored traumatic stress, these parts of our systems that we are not really able to touch and feel like the nervous systems, they're becoming very important for us to look at. And the reason why is because we have got research that is really pointing the way forward around why so many of us struggle to improve, struggle to get better, all these things. Even when we're eating really well, practicing practices to de-stress, why are we still stressed out? Why do we still have these mental illnesses, chronic illnesses, etc.? So the one thing I wanted to start off with is what actually is nervous system regulation? Then I'll get into specific questions. And if we think about our system as a whole, I've got to go back to the beginning. So when we are born into the world, we are as a human system, as a human being, immature. We are completely dependent on our primary caregivers to feed us, clothe us, shelter us, listen to our cues of when we might be cold or too hot or hungry or uncomfortable. Um, and these ways that we interact with our primary caregivers, that starts to form what is called the regulation of not just the nervous system, but the entire system. That's how we learn language. That's how we get to understand social cues. Children that are not given that end up not either living very long or they cannot be communicative in the human sense. And we know this from studies where we look at kiddos who have been in orphanages 
where they're not tended to, they're not cared for just because there aren't enough people. So our autonomic nervous system, give a little science lesson here because it's important. If you're brand new, this is gonna be maybe brand new to you. If you're here from a long time ago and you've been doing this work forever, this might be review, but see it in a new light if, you are, um, if you've been around. And if this is new to you and you want more, clearly stick around and we'll talk about more and other videos will show you this. But our autonomic nervous system governs two main things. This is very important when it comes to understanding chronic illness, mental illness, and our inability or ability to connect with others in the environment and be comfortable in our own skin. So our autonomic nervous system, also known as the ANS, it drives our survival responses. So the fight, flight, and freeze. The fight, flight, and freeze. Most of us understand fight, flight. It's that perfect analogy of the caveman running away from the saber-toothed tiger because it's being chased, it goes into survival mode, it flees. The other thing that can also happen is this ability to fight, to try to fend off the attack, to fend off the threat. Freeze is something that's less talked about. However, it's being talked about a lot more now because it is actually the setting in our autonomic system, autonomic nervous system that we default to. I'll say that one more time. It's the setting in our autonomic nervous system that we default to when we can't fight and we can't flee. Make sense? Let me know if that makes sense. So with this, we get into a bit of a pickle because our autonomic survival impulses are only meant to stay on for a very short period of time. When we were back in the day in the savanna, if we were chased and taken as food, um, that was it, we were done, we were over. Or if we defended that tiger and got it and let's say killed it, not that you know we wanna think about killing tigers, but I think you get that too, then we would be fine. No more threat, we come down. However, in our current Western world, this is not our reality. It's not about tigers and chasing them and hunting them. There are different stressors in different traumatic events, different environmental circumstances that make it such that it's not cut and dry. They are insidious, these micro traumas and stressors. They might be our parental system. It could be the school system. It could be the way we've been cultured and conditioned to not know how to feel our system. So what has happened, and I'm talking very collectively right now, I'm generalizing, but this is why we have an epidemic of mental and chronic illness, addiction, trouble relating to our kids, knowing how to work with them, how to parent them, how to bring them up in a secure, um, attuned way, is we get stuck in these fight, flight, freeze responses, specifically the shutdown response, the freeze response. Under that freeze response are those fight, flight mechanisms that are still rolling around. They're having a party in the body, they're in chaos, and not only does that cause this sense of fear, this sense of panic, terror, this sense of the world is a dangerous place, and this also sense of disconnection. So hold that for a second. We've got this chaos going in on the, in the system. The survival impulses are full tilt. They're running the show. The second function of our autonomic nervous system, so I said there are two functions. The one is the survival. We need it. We need these fight, flight, freeze responses for when there is a real threat. And this autonomic nervous system, it also governs our physiology. So with that, tune in and maybe ask yourself, what is my physiology? Here are some of the things. Our immune system, our cardiovascular system, the pumping of the blood to the vessels, shifting blood pressure. If we were all, if you're sitting, if you were to come up to stand, the blood pressure has to change to give more blood so that we don't pass out. Some of my people, and some of you might know, if you have dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system, that when you stand up, there isn't proper blood pressure change and there's a dizziness. This is an example 
of the autonomic nervous system not knowing how to shift in relationship to the changing environment. So to go back, other things that the autonomic nervous system governs, the digestion. This is huge. Many people have troubles with their digestion. And with that, we try to fix a diet, we try to do all these practices, and then we still find that we're having trouble with the digestion, with things like IBS and Crohn's and irritable bowel, et cetera. And we're like, I'm doing all the right things diet-wise. I'm even doing all the mindfulness, some questions we got of, of that, I'll get into that in a second. And yet, why is my gut still not well? Um, so I said immune system, digestion, cardiovascular system, our hormonal system. So how our hormones are secreted for our capacities to go to sleep at night or wake up in the morning for the females here, the ability to have a healthy reproductive system that just does what it's supposed to do is in good flow. Our ability to socially engage and relate to other people and see the environment around us is also indicative of a healthy autonomic nervous system. So there are so many pieces to how our fight, flight, freeze responses and these biological systems connect. So if you can imagine this, these biological systems, so for simplicity I'll just name a few again, immune, hormonal, gut, cardiovascular, social, these systems if we are living in survival stress and we have got unresolved trauma within not just our nervous systems but within our entire organism because it can impact the tissues, it impacts the organs, etc. If we've got that running around in our system, these physiological systems will be thrown off. And that's how we have seen chronic illness pop up in people. So I wanted to give that general, general overview. I've simplified it in less than 10 minutes, but I wanted to start off with what is regulation of the nervous system? Regulation is when our autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, are working in good harmony. They're in good flow. They go into alert when there is a stress, when there is a need to defend, but then when we're not in that, it comes out and down. The, the trouble or the pickle, I should say, that we are in here as humans is that often these stressors, these points of threat, they never go away, especially when we're really little, when we're living in a family system that is abusive, that isn't safe. Typically, it's because that system, those parental structures, those parents, those caregivers are living in their own dysregulation and their own traumatic imprints, and then that gets passed on to the kids. And it isn't through necessarily genetics, it's through environmental circumstance. The, ge the genetics get passed on, but it is how they are expressed that is most important, and they are expressed based on environmental conditions and how we are modeled from the very beginning. Okay, thank you everybody for saying where you're from. We've got some folks from Germany and Australia and, and Germany and um, the states, Kentucky, hello. Okay got about 33 people on the line. So I'm gonna get into um, some basic questions and then as bigger themes pop up, I am gonna refer back to this introduction that I just gave you. So someone asked, are there physical therapies that can unblock stored energies and trauma, specific types of massage or something that's called EMDR, for example? So this is a great question. And I have to go back to that regulation of the nervous system. So there are definitely various therapies. I like to call them modalities. I have studied methods such as the Feldenkrais method, somatic experiencing, somatic practice. I am someone who loves to get massage and osteopathic um, medicine and reflexology. And here's the thing that I have discovered. When we do not have as a human, so if you are the person going into one of these practices, we want to make sure that you as the participant knows how to feel and sense the body and be with the sensations, the energies, the feelings, all of the intricacies that are inside. If I think back to when I was a lot younger, say in my 20s, I remember having acupuncture done. 
but I didn't have the training. I didn't have the knowledge, the smarts, if you will, to listen to my physiology, to listen to my emotions, to listen to my sensations, to track the energy in my body. I just wasn't skilled at it because again, it's not something while I was physically well and fit and had good ability to socially engage with people, there wasn't this tuned, this fine tuning to my internal environment to know how to track what was going on when I had one of the acupuncture needles go into my system and then to follow how that energy changes in the body. So there are many things that can help release stored up trauma and energy, but if we as the receiver are not able to um, pay attention to those things, we're going to miss it, we're not going to feel it, and it may not actually make a difference. Now, I like to make parallels. Let's say we had a broken arm, and we went to the hospital to get it fixed, and we had to get it replaced, we had to get a cast on. No matter what happens, that will get fixed. Let's just assume the doctor is really good. It'll get fixed. You don't have to understand the method of how they did that. It's just a physical thing. They go in, they do their handiwork. Of course, you have to be good to it and not go and be um, forceful with it, but it's going to heal. Granted, you do all the right steps. So there are certain things in our medical world, in our healing world, um, where you go, you get something. It's like taking a course of antibiotics. I always use that example. They'll probably work, even if you're not tuned into your body. If you're tuned into your body, the healing actually might be better and more solid, but it'll work. With this work, this work of healing unresolved trauma, getting into the sensations, tracking energy, it's not the same. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense because we might miss something. So the job of the practitioner is to ensure that you as the client or student is aware of these things. And here's the thing, not many folks have the time in a session that is maybe only an hour long or 30 minutes to teach you how to sense the body because it can take many months and many years to get refined in feeling this body. Now don't let the, the number of many years scare you. If we go back, I gotta always go back to the baby. Go back to how when we are born. We do not figure it all out in a few months. It takes us months and years to develop our cognition, to develop our, what's called our interoception, our ability to sense what's going on. So as an adult, and I'm gonna assume we're all adults here, be very gentle on yourselves when you're starting off this path because it's like learning a new language. It's not going to happen in a few weeks, in a few months. It will take years to rebuild something that was maybe never built in the first place. And I say that with full sincerity. Many of us were brought into this world. We did not have parental structure or an environmental structure that allowed for the regulation, the co-regulation, the building of a strong nervous system. So there are definitely therapies, to go back to this original question, it was from Rohan, um, that help to release. But what I have found is that when we, as the human, going into this, can have a better idea of what to look for and build something called capacity, I'm going to talk about that in a second, um, those energies, those traumas, tend to find their way out on their own. And I have seen that we have been very, um, I like to use the word unrefined. We've been very unrefined in how we teach people how to work with healing trauma. We think it's just about shaking. We think it's just about talking the trauma away, um, doing things that are very structured to try to get a release. And here's what's interesting. The system is too smart for that. If it is petrified of releasing something that it doesn't want, to feel or think about or feel, it'll keep it stored in. And we might get a little bit out, but it'll be half-baked, so to speak. So we want it to fully be birthed, fully come out, and that's where this other approach that I work with and teach my students tends to make the process a little gentler as opposed to we're going to do this type of therapy to get this type of trauma out, and then we're going to be said and done. It's too simplistic. 
Okay. Cool. Um, let's keep going here. One question from Anne. Does SE therapy, so that is somatic experiencing, usually involve touch and table work? So touch as in physical touch or a person being on the table having touch um, done to them. And the answer is sometimes, but not always. It depends on the training of the person. So there are certain places in the world, especially in the United States, where um, there are laws, which really sucks, about whether or not you can touch a client, especially in the world of psychotherapy. Usually it's not all permitted to touch. You're not even allowed to hug your client at the end of a session. Lots of these rules that really, in my opinion, make it distasteful in how we work with people. If we were working with a child, helping them feel better after an accident, we're going to touch them. We're going to rub their back a little bit. We're going to put our hands on their shoulder to say, I'm here for you. If they want a hug, we're going to give them a hug. We're not going to say, oh, that's not in my um, ethics to touch you like that. So that's another story. But some SE therapies, SE therapists, practitioners will use touch. Some will not. It depends on the type of trauma. It depends on their training. It obviously depends on the pers pers uh, the um, recipient, the participant, the client, because it isn't about, oh, we're going to work on early trauma, therefore we're going to do this touch work because that's what we were trained to do. Again, you have to have a conversation with your practitioner because you may not be ready for touch. It might be too threatening to go into that kind of work immediately, and you might need to start by building rapport, by doing more self-guided touch, where the therapist is having you feel what it's like to touch your own system. If it's hard for us to touch ourselves, and if you want, you can play with this as I'm, I'm doing this, it actually feels quite nice because my hands are quite cold. So if you find it difficult to connect and touch your own system, chances are it's going to not be the best for someone else to just go in with touch work. The touch work that's done in the SE community has mostly been driven obviously by Peter Levine. His background is not in psychotherapy. It was in body work, specifically rolfing. Um, but it's also been driven by a woman by the name of Kathy Kane, one of my mentors. And she was in the body work world, the osteopathic world. Um, she wrote a book on orthobionomy, which involves touch. Um, so there might be touch, there might not. It is a beautiful way to work at the level of the nervous system because our skin, right, is one of, it is the largest organ in the body and it has all these nerve receptors that communicate with the entire nervous system. So it is a very nice way to work with someone. There is a video I did, um, my assistant Crystal is on right now with us. She can pop that into the comments on how to find a good somatic practitioner. It was just from a few weeks ago. There's an article that goes with that um, on my blog post and a video. I go through like the five main things you need to know when finding a somatic practitioner. I highly recommend everybody here watch that afterwards, after this, um, along with some other videos I'll probably mention. Just because it's not... It's, it's, this is, it's like you're wanting to interview someone for some real serious work, because this is very serious work. So go into this with a little more, um, it's like you're interviewing someone for a job position, because that's essentially what's happening. Okay, moving on. Someone asks, what are the best supplements for nervous system health, health especially for those of us with autoimmune issues? Now, I do not um, offer this advice, because I do not know each individual, where their system is, what their dietary habits are like, what their allergies might be, their sensitivities. I came from a background of applied human nutrition, sports nutrition. Um, my master's was actually in the field of health science and biomed science and, and food science. And yet I don't offer advice around this because I can't. Now, of course, we want to all have a very diet that suits our physiology, our cultural genetics. Certain cultures do better with different foods. Um, and we need to really figure that out for ourselves. Um, so this is where consulting with a really solid nutritionist, naturopath, 
making sure I'm all for the medical system getting your blood chemistries looked at to make sure that the levels are where they should be. I'm going to admit it's not always going to be 100% accurate, but it's a first sweep. So there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with going and having a good overall physical and medical to see and make sure that levels are all there. But what I found, um, and this will come into how we heal chronic illness, and maybe I'll just speak to that right now, rather than there's many questions I have on specific chronic illnesses. Um, so first of all, I don't offer advice on supplements. You have to go and find that information for yourselves. I will say this, be cautious about taking supplements just because the label says this is going to improve immune system health. Our systems aren't that simple. This is where, again, like I said, working with someone who understands supplements and herbs is very important because it changes. It's not something that you just start taking and then you do that for 10 years. Your system changes, the time of year changes. If your immune system is down, it changes. It's just like listening to what your system wants for food. If we eat the exact same thing every day, our body's not gonna like that, but we also don't wanna have so much variety that the system gets confused. So if we think about, if I go back to this idea of um, autoimmune, I'm gonna lump this actually. And there's a video I did a little while back on the origins of chronic illness. And, and the thing that's most important to understand with chronic illness, and I'll define that, that would be, we call it in our work, syndro syndromes. It's a fancy word, syndromes, S-Y-N-D-R-O-M-E-S, -E syndromal representations. These are things that occur when the system has had enough. To quote one of my favorite authors, Gabor Maté, his book, When the Body Says No, that was one of the first passes where I read something that really talked about the autonomic nervous system. Again, I talked about that at the very beginning of this talk, so if you're joining me now, go back when I'm done and listen to the beginning. But when our autonomic nervous system is constantly living in a state of survival, fight, flight, and freeze, when those two things are running the front of our bus, it's like having the gas on and the brake on at the same time. The nervous system is in chaos. And when the nervous system is in chaos, that survival component, it directly impacts all of the organismic systems, like the immune system, the hormonal system, the cardiovascular system, the gut system, and so on and so on. Lymphatic system, for example. So when we have that drive, that go, 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 and that break on the freeze, eventually the system cannot repair anymore. It breaks down. It cannot immune enhance. The gut lining cannot be repaired. The, the blood that should be going to the system in good flow is stagnant so it doesn't bring out waste products. So many examples here. And so for us within this field that I work with, chronic illness would be fibromyalgia. It would be irritable bowel. It would be something like rheumatoid arthritis, all the autoimmune conditions, Hashimoto's, um, things that are a bit more severe like Raynaud's, things like complex pain syndrome, regional pain syndrome, chronic pain, um, migraine headaches that, are, that aren't just from one stressful event but that are always there. Um, something that I would consider um, severe PMS, so premenstrual syndrome. Um, Peter Levine, again, um, someone that I've learned with, he would call uh, PMS a reproductive migraine. If we think about these systems, if you've ever studied or looked at anatomy book, all of the organs here, right, maybe even bring your hand and just say hello to your organs, all the reproductive organs, they require a lot of blood, they require a lot of good flow, and they require rest. They need to go into down mode and chill mode so that the cells can repair, we can get rid of waste products, get, get rid of viruses, cancerous cells, all these things. So that's one piece. When we're living in survival stress and it never comes down, we can live a life that is actually quite functional but have this survival stress there all the time. When we rest, 
when we go to sleep at night, even if we are sleeping, if we've got this survival, we're not going to go into the proper tone. I'm going to say that one more time. We're not going to go into the proper tone of what the system wants to repair. The tone is something specific. It's called the low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic nervous system. I know that's a long word, but it's part of our vagus nerve that allows healing and repair to happen. We could sleep really deep at night, but a deep kind of sleep that's verging on what we would call shut down sleep, this conked out exhaustion where the exhaustion is so high that we're so depressed and in such low metabolic energy that there actually isn't enough metabolism at night to repair the system. So a lot of people will say, yeah, but Irene, I sleep tons at night. I just pass out and I'm dead to the world, but I wake up and I just feel kind of heavy and lethargic still. That typically means that that sleep has been what's called high tone dorsal parasympathetic. So there is this rest, but the rest is not restorative rest. It's shut down rest. You might be wondering, well, how do we change that? That is something I will get into. It comes back to what I said maybe 20 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. We need to learn the language of the nervous system. We need to work at building back our capacity to feel sensation, to feel the biology, emotion, and all the things that we've trapped and frozen in our system because it's been too hard to deal and feel with these things. So I wanted to do a sweep on this idea of chronic illness because we kind of lob it into a medical condition and it's the, the symptoms that we're trying to fix, which we do need to alleviate. We need to you know, be able to be sane in our days. So we might need to take something. We might need to use something to help mitigate the symptoms, but we need to look, it's like a, it's like a, a garden, you know, if, if we do all the things like give the plants water and the vegetables water and we make sure that the, the pests aren't there and all those things, if the soil isn't rich in nutrients and we don't have that sun for photosynthesis, we're not going to grow a garden. It just won't happen. And so the system is the same way. We can offer the system supplements and, and things like essential oils to help calm the system. Um, all these things that we do that we would call a resource, but if we're not getting to that underlying autonomic nervous system dysregulation, that chronic illness is never fully going to heal. Um, some people have often asked, is it possible to fully heal a chronic illness? I have seen that happen, yes, and um, it takes a lot of work. I will be very honest. So be sure to know that the journey is not um, like taking a course of antibiotics or even fixing a broken bone. It's something that you have to continue to work on. It's like staying fit and well and eating well. It's an ongoing process. Okay, thank you all of these people. Um, can you post the um, book? I, my mentor, Kathy, it is Kathy Kane, K-A-I-N. I actually did a great interview with her. Um, it's on my YouTube channel. Crystal will pop that up for you. Um, Alina, I mean, everybody else who wants to um, learn from Kathy because she has taught me a lot. All right, moving on. Um, this is from Amy. What part of the nervous system gets damaged by trauma? What happens to damage it? Is it nerves dying, rewiring? What is rewiring? That's a good question. How does a healed nervous system look biologically and physiologically versus a traumatized system? What is the mechanism? What nerves get affected? I think I have a million questions. Having lots of questions is super good, Amy. So first of all, I wrote about what a healthy nervous system looks like in another article. You guys are going to have your homework after this call. Uh, Crystal will also pop that in. Um, so what happens when we have a healthy nervous system is our digestion works. If we have a virus come into our system, it gets fought. Um, if we have a bacteria, the system takes care of it. Now, this does not mean that we might not get a common cold. Um, I got one a few months ago. It's how our system recovers after that that is the key. Um, if we think about someone who does have a compromised nervous system, let's say someone who has AIDS, for example, or an autoimmune condition where the nervous system is already 
depressed and suppressed, them getting a common cold can mean the death of them, right? And it's just how it happens. So an elderly person getting a common cold can lead them to pneumonia, which someone, say my age, will just get a bit of a cough and a chest congestion, but then it, it heals. So there is a level of spectrum here. The question was, what part of the nervous system gets damaged by trauma? It's our entire system. It is not just the nervous system. Again, I talked about a second ago, the autonomic nervous system. There's a central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. We know now that when there is chronic stress that does not go away and we are constantly bathing in our own stress physiology, which is what happens to us when we're not healing at this level, which I hopefully, hopefully that really landed. If we're not healing at this level, it doesn't take care of itself. I know that from working with enough people, um, we can't meditate our way out of trauma, and there were a few questions on meditation that I will get into. Um, we need to work at this deep physiological level and learn the language of our system. So the trauma, the unresolved stress, I like to call it stress, survival chemistry, it impacts everything because it isn't, mm, I've got this orange highlighter here. It's not like a little virus that comes in and then just maybe goes to one area. When we have got unresolved survival stress, it's like a showering through all of our cells. So it may impact our digestion, it may impact our immune system, our hormonal system, our ability to think cognitively. When we are running at high survival energy levels, our higher brain, everybody say hello to their higher brain, the cognition up here that makes us human isn't online as fully as it can be. Sure, we know how to tie our shoelaces in the morning, we know how to prepare a meal for ourselves or our kids, we know how to drive a car, but a lot of people will say, I can't think, my memory is a huge one. Loss of memory has been connected to this high level of traumatic stress. The hippocampus stores our memories. When it is assaulted with a lot of stress chemicals like cortisol, it shrinks, it gets damaged. So it affects everything. A healed nervous system is the opposite of that. Again, check out that article I wrote. And then your other question here is, what is rewiring? What is wiring? Rewiring and wiring is kind of always happening. So when we're born, there are certain wires that are there. If we are born full term, right, this is important. If we're not born full term, that's why we have to keep babies really safe. This is why we put them in incubators and have to help them with maybe their breathing, these sorts of things. But let's say we're born full term, there are certain things that are wired pretty well. There's a reason why a baby can poop and pee pretty easily. Those systems have been, have been created. The respiration has been created. The cardiovascular system is set. The heart hopefully is strong and it builds and gets stronger with more interaction with the environment. What isn't wired when we're little is things like language, things like knowing how to walk, how to manipulate our hands, so and connect socially and self-regulate. So wiring occurs based on need and based on the time point we are in our lives. The interesting thing is, is if we don't get a lot of that wiring early on, the first three years of life are critical. Critical, critical, critical. We need to be with those little ones for the first three years of life because that system is not fully wired yet and it continues to grow even into our 20s. But those first three years, very important. So we want that wiring, we want that connection, that attunement, etc. If we didn't get it, and this happens to many of us, um, my husband I talk about a lot, I'm allowed to talk about him, he's given me permission. While he had a roof over his head, lots of food, safety, he was held, the attunement was off because his parents were not fully regulated in their system, so things were not properly wired with safety. His map of being brought up was that of danger. The world is not safe. Everyone is out to lunch, even though they're there, and I feel alone and left. And so as he grew, as he aged, as he learned, as he learned the language of his nervous system, as he met me and other people interested in this topic, 
he started to wire connections that had never been wired before, such as wanting to be in relationship, wanting to co-regulate. Um, his gut was a mess forever and ever and ever. And as this work got better and more baked in, the digestion started to improve, the immune system started to improve, the flow in the body started to improve, his strength got back into system. So I'm saying that because I've seen folks who have been brought into the world with severe, severe complex PTSD, he being one of them, severe social anxiety and gut problems and all these things, and I've also seen that completely shift around such that um, it's as if he was brought up in the first three years of life solid and secure. So I say that to give everyone here a lot of hope and a lot of um, positivity towards the fact that we can rewire. To go back to the question of the wires, there's something called neuroplasticity. Hopefully everybody's heard of that. Give me a little knowledge if you give me a, a click or something if you know of the term neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity basically means the capacity for the nervous system to be plastic. It is a positive or a negative. Neuroplasticity is also why we have addiction. It's also why we have bad habits. And neuroplasticity can be also health. So to me, things are either going in a positive or a negative. Negative does not mean that we are, are does not mean that we're always feeling happy, that everything is always perfect. It's that we know what to do when we have a difficult sensation, a difficult circumstance come in, and we can bounce with that and not shut down and not go into the defense all the time, but that we can feel the reverb through our system go, whoa, I'm in a bit of a fight flight response right now. Isn't that interesting? Or, whoa, I just totally shut down and disconnected and I don't feel a damn thing. Interesting. Having that awareness is the first step to learning the language of your nervous system because many of us up until now have not even known how to pay attention to that. So by paying attention and learning these different levels, we then are able to shift our system from just staying, I like to say, soaking in survival stress. We do not want to stay soaking in survival stress. It's not good. Okay, someone says co-regulating. Is this a word that describes relationship? Not necessarily. Co-regulation is what we do as humans to regulate our system. We can actually, in a strange way, co-regulate with ourselves by finding resources. So um, let's pretend this is a hot cup of tea. It's no longer hot. I, my hands were very cold when I started this call. Um, and they started to warm up as I started to talk and be a bit more engaged with you guys. I was going more into something called the social engagement part of the nervous system, which meant that my blood was flowing to my face and all these things. Um, and so in some strange way, I was able to co-regulate by connecting with you guys and I can't see you and it allowed my system to warm up. But I had this cup of tea here such that if that didn't occur, I can bring my hands to it, and that offers me a bit of a, a bit of a resource to feel and remember how to bring that circulation back. So co-regulating is a tricky one because it can happen with ourselves, but it can also happen with external resources, and it can happen, obviously, with another person. Okay. Someone says, Jennifer says, let me have a little drink of this tepid tea. Um, I'm often triggered in relationship, lots of different triggers. Does healing mean I won't get triggered, won't get triggered as often, and that I'll recover my equilibrium faster, all of the three? So when we are um, more regulated in our nervous system, of course we're going to get triggered. I was triggered this morning about something. And it's how we deal with it. Remember how I said a second ago, if we can really notice our system dropping into fight, flight, or freeze, we then know what to do with it. It's when we don't know that that's happening, when we don't have the self-awareness to tune in and be like, oh, I'm getting a little tense. My shoulders are getting tense. My claws are wanting to scratch someone's eyeballs out. If we can't notice that tension building or that 
flaccidness, which is often the shutdown response, then we won't know how to shift it. So triggers will, all, will always be there. Stressors will always be there. We're all, we will all experience someone in our life who will die. It's a given. Someone who will get into an accident, these sorts of things. So there will always be stress. There will always be triggers and traumatic events. The key is how are we equipped capacity-wise to be with those things so that we are not spiraling into more stress and more autonomic dysregulation. And we will recover our equilibrium faster without a doubt because we're aware of it. Um, if I go back to my husband's example, um, when we first met, something that threw him off could take him weeks to recover from, weeks. And then it became maybe a week. And then it was a few days. And then it was maybe a day. Now it might be a few hours. And even now it could be not even a minute or two and something recovers because he is able to catch these things differently and his system has that much more capacity so it doesn't have to shut down. It doesn't have to go into defense. I keep using the word capacity, so I'm going to give you an example. Um, for those of you who here has seen my swimming bowl and, bowl and beach ball analogy, if you haven't, make, make sure to check out my healing trauma series. Um, but I always liken our system, our physiological system, to a swimming pool. Swimming pool. So if you imagine a swimming pool, like a 50-meter lap pool, Olympic size, and imagine that pool has all these beach balls in it, right? Big beach balls, small beach balls. We could throw in some of those unicorn things that people float in on the beach, just all these things floating in there. If you think about the body's capacity as the pool, then imagine that those balls are trapped old traumatic stresses, survival stress, events that we haven't looked at, emotions we've suppressed and not allowed ourselves to feel, conversations we've never had that we should have. All these things are in this pool. When those, that pool is packed with all of those balls, beach balls, what have you, there's not a lot of flow. It's tight. And not a lot can come in because it's already packed. And it's even hard to take things out because they're so squished. So part of building more health within the nervous system, there's two things. One is to make that pool bigger. So what happens if you make that pool bigger, bigger, and the same amount of balls stay in there? Hopefully you guess it. There's more flow. The other thing is to take out the balls, right? So to actually work with specific pieces. The third thing is that we don't want any of those balls to come in and stay there. So in other words, any other stressors from here on forward today, what if we could not let them sit in there? So the next time we feel a need to shed a tear or express our frustration or pause when we stub our toe on the kitchen table and it's so painful rather than just walking away and, and stomaching it and trying to breathe deep to not feel that pain, we actually sat there and felt the pain and let it dissipate naturally. So there's all these ways that we can avoid putting more balls into our pool. That does take practice. For me, the first step is that, and it's also making the pool bigger, building capacity. Some of the best ways to start building capacity, it's to realize that you have this system that is biological and to listen to it. So one of the classic um, teachings in my programs I call follow your impulse and basically what follow your impulse means it isn't about um, eating all the cookies in the cookie jar it's my prime example it's listening to when you might need to go to the bathroom when you might be thirsty when you might be full and you've eaten maybe you're hungry and you eat when you're hungry as opposed to starving and starving until you're so hungry that you just you do eat all the cookies in the cookie jar um, listening to your need to rest listening to your need to say something listening to um, all the things that our biology actually tells us but we ignore because we've traditionally been conditioned to not feel these things it starts very young 
And so one of the first ways to building capacity is to actually listen to those biological impulses. Other ways is to bring in the practices of orienting. I've done other videos on this. Crystal can post some of those up for us. Seemingly simple, but right now, what would it be like if you were to take in your environment? So I know you might be looking at the screen. Maybe you're just listening to me. What would it be like to let your eyes see somewhere else in your environment? Could be outside, could be a plant you see, it could be a book sitting over there, it could be a candle holder that's on your wall, so I'm just naming what I'm seeing. By being more connected to our environment, it frees up a little bit of our capacity. It makes it a bit bigger because we're orienting to more than just here. Now, there's a caveat to that, and I will um, release a video on this on Sunday. Sometimes when we connect with the environment, we are afraid of it. We actually feel more of a stress response. This happens often 50% of the time when people are interested in this work and they know they have a chronic illness or a mental illness or a relationship thing going on, and it's a sign that their system was trained to know that the environment and the outside world is dangerous, that nothing can be trusted. So the last thing you're going to want to do is look outside of you. But it can be, it is a way to start to slowly, slowly open up capacity is to see what is around us. If we do not know how to see what is around us, we open ourselves up to danger, to not seeing things that might be threatening, to not seeing that bus coming down the road because we've just been so insular in our head. All these little things. So capacity, again, I've been talking about this pool that we need to build, we need to make it bigger. And the more we build that capacity and we can connect with the world and we can connect with ourselves and we can do it in tandem, those stressors that are inside, those old traumas, again, the metaphor, they loosen up, right? Think back to that swimming pool. And once they're a little looser, what do you think? They're a little easier to take out. It's a little easier to feel that deep pain of that traumatic event that happened when we were 14 at the soccer field, just making that up. Because we've trained ourselves to connect with our general biological sensations like going to the bathroom, being thirsty, being tired, etc. But we've also connected with the external world, which is always a part, it's always playing a part with traumatic experiences. Traumatic experiences do not happen just with ourselves in mind. There's always something from the environment that is impacting us. So to build capacity, we need to, or sorry, to build capacity, we need to get into that system. So that needed to come out because that'll help with some of our other questions. So the question that I've got here um, is, I would love your take on our comfort zone versus our growth zone. This is from Sarah. How do we push ourselves to grow and expand in life while working while we're working to heal traumas? This whole theory of feel the fear and do it anyway, how does that play in with our nervous system? So this is a really good question because we do need to push a little bit. We need to push ourselves sometimes out of our comfort zone, but we want to, again, make sure that we can sense our physiology. If we push but we push and override, by that, mean, by that I mean if we override our physiological um, signals, if we do not know that we're going into shutdown or we're going into more fight or flee, we might push, but it's gonna be at the expense of regulation. And it's gonna be at the expense of other systems paying the price. So maybe we do I, I'll pull an idea out of my head. Maybe we do push ourselves to run that marathon and we train and we build up our cardiovascular system and aerobic system to run that marathon. But maybe we were so driven by that that we did not realize that our ankle or our foot was suffering and in pain. And we were so driven by that 
that we ignored these other signals in our body. This is a true story I'm thinking of. I knew someone who did this. They didn't listen to the signals their body was giving them. And when they came out of um, something, they, they um, fractured their foot without even feeling. You don't just fracture a foot like that. There had been this buildup of strain and pain and the, the, the system not recovering. Things were weak. But the goal, the growth, if you will, was to do this marathon, do this thing. And they pushed it to the point where they, they were not listening to the biology. So the comfort and the growth is something that you as an individual has to play with. But you do not want to grow at the expense of your physiology breaking down in other ways. Does that make sense? Um, I hope that makes sense. So the, the comfort zone, however, is interesting. Because if we have been living in a very unsafe place, where the world is damn dangerous from our upbringing. And um, our past history would say, anytime I go outside, anytime I interact with people, nothing good happens. And I believe that that's true for many of us. However, sometimes we do need to push. We need to take ourselves out of the house and go to a meetup group or um, meet someone in a busier place than normal but then practice connecting with yourself. Practice knowing that you don't have to stay for a whole hour. What if you just stayed for five minutes? But that little bit of a push, that little bit of breaking out of the comfort zone allows the system, and I go back to that idea of the swimming pool, to build a little bit, to grow a little bit. Doesn't mean you, you don't want to go from here to here. Maybe it's just from here to here. And you know, oh, I was just able to do that. And I felt a little bit of intensity. I found myself getting a little panicky and that was okay. And I brought myself back to my center. I felt the ground under me. I oriented a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this way of um, finding it. And someone just said there's a very thin line and there is a very thin line. And part of our job at re-entering into the world is being able to navigate that line and navigate it with smarts, navigate it with intelligence, and not be ego-based. But also think about kids. They need to be not pushed in a, in a bad way, but um, I'm thinking about an example. There's that time when kids are old enough to go up to the grocery store by themselves and get that milk, right? Walk to the corner store by themselves with a little bit of money, you're not going to make someone do that when they're five, just off the bat. You go with them. You show them how it's done. You might get them to give the cash to the cash cashier um, while you're there. You do it enough times so that they know how to do it. And then eventually there's this day where, you know what? They were able to walk to school on their own. They were able to, to ride their bike on their own and come back. Da, 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 da. They know how to ask for help. They know how to call. Da, 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 da. Today is the day. And so you push them a little bit and you never want to push them to the point where they're screaming and crying and I don't want to go, but there's this excitement and they might feel a little scared and that's okay. We think that feeling a little butterfly and a little scared is a bad thing, but it actually gives us the um, agency to know that we can go ahead and try something that's a little, little out of our comfort zone, but we need to, that's how we grow our capacity. Um, someone said, um, presumably there's also a danger zone. There's of course a danger zone, and this is where having solid um, regulation and being able to see our environment and listen to our gut impulses is super important. Um, the gut, so again, bring your hands, say hello to your gut, it connects to the brain, and the brain connects to the gut. And our gut sense, our sixth sense is in this viscera. When we've been brought up in environments where things have not been safe, that gut knowing can be slightly off. It might not be accurate. So part of bringing back that accuracy, part of bringing back um, what would be, we would call healthier neuroception, neuroception is a fancy word for perception of safety or danger, bringing back that solid neuroception means being able to feel our physiology, being able to see the environment, 
being able to notice something's not right about that person or you know what something doesn't feel right about driving down the street right now and I'm gonna listen to that these a lot of people will say oh those woo-woo that's that's stuff that's not secure and concrete it's not true these little hits these intuitive hits we get when we're really listening to them they come deeply from our physiology and our capacity as animals to sense something is not right animals know in the wild if something's coming far far away their sense of sensation is so much heightened because it has to be heightened us humans you've got dull with it because we're not out in the wild listening for the tiniest brush on the tree or feeling the vibration of the earth and something coming closer to us however as humans we do have that sensitivity when we have it and it's tuned well we actually can stay out of danger pretty easily but we have to teach it to ourselves okay um i'm, I'm, I'm gonna go on here how's everyone doing i'm gonna have a little bit more guata there was a question i wanted to really get to this is from adrian and for all of you who are here who asked a question and might not get to all specific questions because I have 16 pages of questions, I hope that something that I've said so far has given you context for your question. The reason I say that is because as you hang out with me more, you're going to find that many of the answers are all the same. It comes down to building capacity. It comes down to being able to listen to your physiology it's quite simple when we break it down. The education is really important, as is the practice, um, but it all funnels into the same categories, really, at the end of the day. So this question is, your thoughts on mindfulness practice, so I'm gonna assume when you say mindfulness, Adrian, you mean more meditative practices. For folks with complex PTSD, um, and you say from ACEs, so that's from Advil, adverse childhood experiences. I have been doing in and off intensely for almost eight years, and I'm hyper aware now, but not necessarily feeling any better. Often I feel much worse, but my therapist tells me to sit with the bad feelings when they come up and it's super hard. Any thoughts? Thank you. So first of all, thank you for the question. ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, these are actually really important for us to understand. And the reason why is because we now know that pretty much most, if not all, complex PTSD, at least in the Western world, is a result of something that occurred to us repeatedly when we were little, or even one big event that was really bad and scary. So adverse childhood experiences. Now, they don't cover everything. They mainly cover, in this specific study that was done in California, and now it's been replicated all around the world, They've covered things like neglect, alcoholism in the family, um, parents going to prison, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, things that just made it not safe to be who you were and express fully as a kid. The other thing that falls into early traumatic experiences, and I must mention them, just in case someone here had a question um, around this, is things like being born premature. We were put in isolation as a child. If we had a surgery when we were really young, before we could even remember, many babies have to go into surgery as soon as they're born. That is a traumatic event. In utero trauma is also very important to understand. So if mama was stressed, if mama had a relationship that wasn't healthy, if mama had to work every day and not let her body sleep when she needed to sleep, she was always stressed out, worried if there wasn't enough food, all these things in utero stress is real. And even um, intergenerational trauma can follow us. And then if we have a few traumatic events growing up, that can lead to complex PTSD. So I just wanted to kind of sweep that topic um, for everyone here. So you say, Adrian, that you feel often worse when doing mindfulness and that you should just, the therapist is saying to just sit with it anyway. This is really unrefined advice, in my opinion, because if we don't know how to sense and feel these bad 
it's not just feelings, but I'm going to assume it's also sensations. We can get trapped in that sensation and emotion to the point where we either go into more hyper arousal, more fight flight, or we shut down and we numb out. There is something called spiritual bypass, which is where we go into these mindfulness practices. And if we go back to that swimming pool, we don't even realize how small our capacity is, how small our pool is. We have so many stressors inside. And then we do this practice that is to ask us to feel this insanely small, filled up swimming pool with all these balls and the system goes, screw you. I don't want to feel any of this. I'm just going to shut off and I'm going to disconnect and I am going to dissociate and disconnect. We might feel that that is actually better, but what that often is, is a shutdown and a numbing of what's actually there. If we find also that when we feel this, we get more, we would call it anxiety, a little bit more arousal, that's also a sign that it's just too much for us to do. So, a, this is super, super common, Adrian and everyone listening. What we have to do is we have to realize that that practice is probably not what we need to do just yet. And one of the things, as simple as it might be, and I teach this obviously in my programs, in my drop-in classes, is to just, can you sense how you touch the ground under you? I know that might seem ridiculously simple, but can you feel the contact that you have with the chair you, you might be sitting on? Your feet that might be touching the floor. Maybe if you're laying back on a couch, maybe you just feel the connection with your back and, and the sofa or the chair. And you just sit and feel and sense that contact. For some of us, that's enough. If we add another layer, it might be okay. And you guys can all do this as I, as I talk those through. What would it be like to feel that contact and at the same time, let your eyes look somewhere that isn't right here? Maybe it's the pieces of paper that are right in front of you. Maybe it's you, let the, you consciously move the eyes and the head, consciously. Slowly, it's not fast, fast, fast. Just slow little lookings. I'd be curious if someone's actually playing along and trying this right now. I'd love to, to hear or see what is it that you feel? What is it that you notice? Because what this is, this is getting back into the basics of biology. Can you sense yourself on the ground? Can you sense a little bit of contact with the floor? And can you see the environment around you? And then if we add one more layer to that, can you just notice the breath? Don't change it, don't make it bigger, don't make it smaller, don't take a deep one, don't go fast. Can you just notice the breath for what it is? These three layered pieces, because someone asked what are some actionable steps, these are some of them along with more education. The more we can understand what is happening, the better we are to be with our bodies. If we don't understand, then we're kind of, it's like we're walking into something blind. So can you sense the ground? Can you see what's around you? And can you feel your breath at the same time? I like to call that multitasking awareness. Can you feel them all at the three times, all together at the, at the same time, getting tongue twisted? What most people will find is that when they sense the ground under them and then they go to look, they lose feeling of the ground under them. This is normal. But this shows how disconnected we are from feeling everything at the same time. Someone asked what would be a sign of good healthy regulation? It would be this, being able to sense the ground as we talk, as we look, as we go to take a zip of water, as we feel a sensation, as we let that sensation move through, as we feel an emotion, maybe we let the tear come out, maybe we let happiness come through, maybe we feel some kind of disgust in our mouth we let that be felt so there's all these things it's all about it isn't to me about this mind thing and i i'm i've done this work long enough to know that it's not enough to just sit and try to clear the mind and meditate that is a very advanced practice 
did a wonderful interview with um, Chris Jerkies, one of my good friends and colleagues. Crystal can pop that up. It's on my YouTube channel where we talk about what meditation actually is. We talk about the different types of meditation and mindfulness and why that practice, these practices were not meant for a newbie to begin with. It's, it's almost um, unethical to say to someone who has no capacity to be with intensity, just keep feeling those bad feelings. That can stir us into a pot that might be hard to get out of. In the old practices, it would take sometimes 20 years before a monk was even allowed to learn how to meditate. And here we are asking people to do it without any learnings of their ABCs, one, two, threes, without any foundation. So that's my little rant there. Um, my thoughts, I would say to not try to meditate anymore, Adrian. That would be my personal and professional opinion. But can you do some of these basic practices that I teach? Come join me for a drop-in class. Check out some of the resources I've got or just practice this three-step thing that I've got here. One of my um, eBooks, I'm gonna forget the name of it. It's, I think, Four Simple Steps to Deal with Overwhelming Emotions and Sensations. I take you through this. So if you want a guided audio, you can do that. But someone, people, some of you said here, when you tapped into this stuff, you felt spacious, you felt more grounded, more settled, more conscious, more available. And it's possible that some of you felt absolute terror and panic and you're like, I hate this. Um, and that's actually really normal when we have not actually tuned into ourselves and the environment in that way. Um, as I said, there's a video that's gonna come out on Sunday and I'll have two others after that as we lead into the new year on um, what happens when we feel panic when we go into these practices, what occurs when we feel shut down and bored when we do these practices, because that's a, that is also a survival response to feel bored and shut down. And what happens when we just feel sensations? What goes on? <clears throat> okay, moving on. Let's do a few more, you guys. Um, where was the one I circled? So this was from um, someone from Instagram. I need a little more water. <clears throat> Simple as that was, I could sense my throat. If I don't wet it right now, I'm going to start coughing, not because I'm sick, but because all this talking kills the moisture. So remember, some of the basic things for getting back into the nervous system is to listen to these little cues. So could you explain the concept of post-traumatic growth? If trauma is not the event in the event itself, but rather how it's perceived by the body and brain, what is it that causes some people to be traumatized versus not? And how does post-traumatic growth, growth factor in? So this is a great question. I actually answer this in thoroughness in my three-part healing trauma series, which you can get, which is posted a bit above on the comments. Oh, and if you guys are listening to this on YouTube, because I'm going to take this and put it onto YouTube, just look in the show more section and I'll have all these links. Um, so here's what's interesting is you're right, Andra. Someone might have a trauma event, like a car accident happened to them, and they walk away totally fine. And maybe it's a big one. Maybe they have a little sore neck, you know, but they don't end up with complex PTSD or PTSD. Another person might be in that exact same car, have the exact same impact, and they walk away and their lives are ruined for the rest of their life. And I've worked with people where this is true. Here's what we know. When that person that walked away with no problems, it means that they had already a lot of capacity in their nervous system and they had good regulation. So they had bounce. They had like shock absorbers in their nervous system. They didn't have so many balls in their system that one more ball cracked the whole pool open. The person who walks away from that accident and everything just falls apart, they end up with digestive problems, they end up having phobias, they end up having chronic pain. Usually it's because, and they may not even know that, knew this because they might have been going along fine in a very functionally frozen way. It's a term we have, functionally frozen, functional freeze. 
So they're working through life, but if you really looked at their capacity, it was already really small and there was a lot of shit in it already. And so you find that out when you start to ask people questions about their life, about what they can do. Typically when someone ends up with that level of um, post-traumatic stress, complex stress after an accident, there was adverse childhood experiences. May not be about abuse or neglect, but maybe they did have a surgery when they were really young. Maybe their system was already super fragile to begin with. We add this thing, it's like this, the, the, what's that saying? The straw that broke the camel's back. The idea of post-traumatic growth, people are trying to use that as a way to not say post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is because when we have got post-trauma and we're not doing well, we really aren't doing well. So maybe it isn't disorder, but it's just post-traumatic stress. I would say post-traumatic syndromes. Talked about syndromes about half an hour ago. Syndrome would be migraine headaches, chronic pain, digestive problems, immune system going crazy. So post-traumatic something. Growth only happens if we actively do something about it. So to say every single person after an accident uh, goes into post-traumatic growth is absolutely inaccurate because not everybody will. If we grow from that accident because we're actively working on the traumatic stress and re-navigating the accident and figuring it out, then yes, it is post-traumatic growth, but it's not a given. So I hope that um, offers a little bit of insight into that. Okay, I'm gonna go a little longer. I'm gonna go for another 10 minutes. So if you guys are still hanging on here, then awesome. Um, as you see, I could be doing this for five hours and we'll do more of these Q and A's. We're gonna try, to, try doing one every Thursday moving forward. Okay, this is from Diana. How can we address people safely and help them with concrete interventions when they don't have the attention span to grasp the concept due to, due to being in permanent fight flight, like post-traumatic stress, borderline personality disorder, or in dorsal states like depression? So, great question. So, basically to reiterate, how can we help people when their attention span is like so small um, and they're in permanent survival stress. So fight, flight, and freeze. And I, I think what it comes down to here are a few things. How old is the person? What's their history like? And are they interested? From my years of doing this, I have found that unless someone is truly interested and wants to heal, and this is the one big caveat that I've become a bit more diligent with saying, do they feel that they deserve to heal? And do they see that this label that they've been given, usually by the DSM, which is a psychiatric diagnostic tool, things like OCD, borderline, PTSD, all these things, are they not attaching to that label? because I found that when people are so attached to a label and a diagnostic, they often, it's like they're wired into that and that is who they are. So the people who are like, this is what I live with, very different than this is who I am. I hope that makes sense. I really learned that when I was practicing in my Feldenkrais practice. When someone comes in with a pain or a problem, we wanna look at it as, okay, what is, the system telling us that isn't right? How is the function off that's creating this, this pain in the lower back or in the knee or the ankle? Can we look at the underlying cause? So if the person has the desire to get better at this deeper level, they're usually more apt to doing small little bits. The concept we have in the somatic experiencing world is titration. Titration is like if I had a dropper with my water, it's like rather than gulping this glass all at once, I'm just giving myself, myself a little bit of a drop, a little bit of a drop, so that my system isn't overloaded. 
So for people with these short attention spans who might go into arousal really quickly or are already in such shutdown that we don't want to drive them more, we want to bring them up a little bit, it might be that we have them feel nothing but the feeling of their feet against the floor. And maybe that means that for them to feel that, they have to, they have to, you can't see me doing this, <laughs> that you have to like get them to stomp the floor a little bit. Maybe they have to do this with their hands to feel some sensation. Maybe they need to squeeze. Maybe they need, um, I think the reason why weighted blankets are getting so popular is it provides pressure and compression. Maybe they need to go outside and hear the birds and then feel the sensation inside of their, their own system. So when you say concrete interventions, this is where um, the work becomes almost like artwork. And I feel like maybe you're asking this because you're a practitioner, you work with people. Um, we have to really understand that the human system, when it is living in survival mode, is very delicate. And it doesn't want a lot. And if it gets too much, it's going to shut down more. So um, I'm pretty certain, and I was talking to someone about this just the other day, I can't remember what the context was, but it had to do with this research that shows that we need like five hugs a day. And if we're in PTSD, we need 10 hugs a day. And if, hug, like being hugged by someone. And if we have this, we need 20 hugs a day because it releases the oxytocin, which is the feel-good chemical that makes us feel safe and connected. That is highly inaccurate for someone who has dysregulation. Because for someone that is living in dysregulation and is not able to connect, or they have a history where touch was not safe, you give that person a hug and they will go into deeper shutdown or more panic, even though technically we release oxytocin when we, are, when we are hugged. So there's these things that we tell people to do that are not, they don't line up with the individual specificity of each, each person is gonna be different. So if you're a practitioner, you just have to be really smart and understand these elements and these distinctions of all the different levels of the nervous system. It's one of them is called the polyvagal theory. Um, I did a longer video on that that Crystal can pop up. But these are the different levels that our system goes to based on where we are, when we are safe or not safe. It literally, I like to think of a gearbox in a good old car. You know, we shift into different gears based on where we are, who we're with, how we're feeling, did we get enough sleep the night before, are we excited because whatever's happened. So it's going to be really different with how we work with people based on where they are at um, in that day. And it's intra-individual as well as intra-individual, intra versus inter. Intra means just because someone was able to handle, say, that hug the day before, that doesn't mean the next day they're, they're going to want it. And this is where um, I think the conversation around permission and attunement is really important. If we have attunement in ourselves, we can attune quite well to someone else without having to say, is it okay if I hug you today? If we're attuned to ourselves and we have that spidey sense, we do not have to answer that question. We just know based on their body language. By not having that conversation, it actually lets that person know that you actually can sense them in a way that they were maybe never sensed and felt when they were little, right? That's one of the biggest gifts we can give our clients or our spouse or our kids is rather than pushing stuff on them, can we really see them and feel them and guess in a way that's intelligent? That makes them feel even more safe to be like, let's give you a hug today because I think you need it. It's like they might not need it. Um, so that was my roundabout way of saying, how can you um, help people with concrete interventions? You can help them by really attuning to them and only giving them what they can handle. And if, and if they don't know, ask them. But the best thing is being able to attune to that and know, oh yeah, this person, um, we're just gonna sit here and talk. And you know what, maybe they just need a glass of water. And that's enough. Okay. What time are we at? Let's get into one more and then we'll, we'll go. Um, 
This is a big question, but I'm going to answer it. Um, someone asks, can you talk about trauma in utero? And then there's another question up above. One is from Alonzo, one is from Patty. What is the difference between treating developmental and early trauma um, versus generational? Okay, so there are many different types of traumas. In utero, intergenerational, early, developmental, surgical, anesthesia, shock traumas, vicarious trauma, natural disaster trauma, there's so many. And we could say, for simplicity's sake, that at the end of the day, it's all about restoring safety back to the system. That the system knows it is there, it is okay, it's not going to die, and that there's some safety in, in the world. When we have had a lot of in utero trauma and early trauma and intergenerational trauma, the system basically is programmed to believe that the world is a dangerous place and we're all going to die. This is very indicative of people who are um, uh, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. There's been studies on this. These kids were not born in the Second World War. They were born here in North America, and yet they have a high level of anxiety, high levels of cortisol. That followed them from their grandparents being encamped and enslaved in the concentration camps and then getting out. So there's this sense that the world really is a dangerous place because it was for them. A kiddo who was born um, and then adopted usually means something wasn't right. There wasn't the circumstance for that little one to stay with birth mother. Um, maybe there was um, a disability or a defect and the mother didn't want to, couldn't deal with the consequences of having to um, heal and be with and nurture a little one that has more needs. There's abandonment merit there. That means that the world was not safe. Maybe that child came from a war-torn country, which is so common right now. So if we were working with these in, in utero developmental traumas, other traumas, it comes down to safety. It comes down to recognizing that somewhere along that, that pattern of conception, preconception, in utero, first few years of life, there was unsafety. Our job as a caregiver, our job as the practitioners is to, first of all, learn deeply the differences in our autonomic and autonomic nervous systems branches, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Again, I've got a few more videos on that. Um, Crystal, I think you're still here. Um, it's one of the trauma tip videos where I divide all the nervous systems um, to learn deeply about the polyvagal theory, the different levels the next thing for the parent, you have to do your own work. It's not just on the kiddo. You've got to do your own work. Even if you weren't the reason that little one was traumatized, if you are more attuned with yourself, you will be able to attune better to them and they will feel it. If you have a partner and you're raising this child, you and your partner have to be 100% on the same page. You have to like each other. You have to process your own emotions. You have to show what it is to be in good, healthy relationship. If you are not, everything that little one will feel and it will make it worse. I know I'm being a bit blunt, but I've seen enough of this to know that you must, must have good relationship with your primary partner or the people who are helping you, whether it's a nanny or a grandma or a grandpa or a sibling or an auntie that comes in. There needs to be good, solid connection and community because that little baby will feel everything. And then it'll come out in behavior that you think is because of that kid and often it's them expressing what you, what we as adults are not expressing. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the next thing is to seek out whether you work with me. Um, a lot of the folks who have gone through my longer program, Smart Body, Smart Mind, we get into working with what's called the stress organs. For the one here, someone who has um, a little one who ind adopted um, a baby, this is important to know. I'm just going to give a sweep of this. The stress organs are the kidneys, the adrenals, the gut, and the brain stem. I'm sweeping them real quickly. To understand how those react in stress, again, I can't teach you how to do this over this interface. I ethically can't do that, but we teach you how to work with that so that you know how to tune into those stress organs 
for the little ones so they feel safety, greater attunement, and just this sense of there's this, this person, these people who are attuning to this part of my body that I feel and it's really scared and wow, someone's actually telling me that I'm okay, that I'm a bit safer, but it isn't through a verbal, you're okay, you're okay, you're safe. It's actually getting skilled at tuning into these organs that when you are little, before you can talk, they are the organs that know how to talk stress. They feel unsafety, they poof adrenaline, poof cortisol. The, the brain stem will tighten up. It'll get, it'll, it'll get defensive. The gut will clench. This is where we end up with kiddos with tummy aches all the time. They're stressed. They're not safe. They're not being communicated with properly. And then we see it in a symptom, but really it's their stress organism saying, something's not right. I'm going to clamp down because I can't, I can't trust the environment anymore. So there's a huge level of how can you create safety for the kids, for your own system, so they feel safety in their environment, and really allowing um, responses to come out that might not seem normal, that might seem a little odd. Um, kids that often, when they're little and they've been in abusive, unsafe environments, they'll show a lot of aggression, a lot of behavior that looks like they're trying to be mean and hurtful. That's not true. They're trying to get that fight flight out. They're trying to get that running response out. So we need to keep them safe, but we also have to let them get it out. Um, and in terms of us adults, so I'll wrap up with those of us here who had upbringings that were not safe, the same holds true. There is a way to work with those stress organs. Again, whether you choose to work with me a little deeper, there's also practitioners that can work with you one-on-one, -on -one, namely, those trained in somatic experiencing and especially something called somatic practice. Um, that is the level of working with early and developmental trauma as an adult, right? So just because we had those things happen to us does not mean that we cannot work on that as adults. We can, I've seen it happen, it's beautiful work um, because we get into that deep, that deep physiology that is looking for safety. And at the end of the day, the system, the nervous system, it wants safety. It wants regulation because working from that level, working with regulation is easier on the body. It's less metabolic energy. It's not as taxing on the immune system, the gut system, the endocrine system. Mammals, us, we are meant to have a lot of oxygen and blood flowing through our bodies. But when we are in that shutdown response, which is often where we go and when it's been unsafe, we slow everything down. We become really slow and stagnant. And so we need that energy to come back to the system so that we have just good health in general, but also we know that things are safe so that we can engage with the environment. Okay. I'm going to stop talking because my throat is definitely said that's enough. Um, a lot was covered today. I know that there were a lot of questions that were asked that I didn't get to specifically. Please know it's not because I wanted to ignore them, but these Q&As often have to go into some education or else I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Next week I'll do another Q&A and I'll probably start off from the questions that weren't answered today and we'll just keep working through them. But I hope, I hope you see that there are fun fundamental foundations to understand so that we can do this work. I can't hand you a prescription and say, do these steps. It doesn't work with this work. That's why it's beautiful work. That's why it's work that sticks. But it isn't as cut and dry. It's very complex. And it's complex because we're complex. And the only way we're going to heal this human condition is with complexity and getting into the artwork that is healing the nervous system at this deeper level. So if you have not um, checked out my site, irenelion.com, be sure to go there. There are a plethora of free resources. We've just updated the site. Everything is there now. Um, I do recommend checking out the Healing Trauma three-part series. If you haven't started my 21-day nervous system tune-up, that's a self-study starter course. You can start that today. It's uh, $297. You can also do three pays. And then if you want to really get into this work and join me um, and my team for something we run once a year, Smart Body, Smart Mind, opens for enrollment in February, and we start March 1st. 
Um, everyone's welcome. It isn't just for practitioners. It not, it's not just for folks with chronic illness. It's for everyone. So check those out. Do some free stuff. Come to another one of these. We're going to do a drop-in class in two Saturdays. On, I think it's the 21st. Um, it's a Saturday, not this one, but the next. Um, that's a way to get into some more of the practice. And keep showing up. The fact that you showed up and listened to this, whether it's live or the recording, you're contributing to the health and healing of the world. I mean that with full sincerity. So be very proud for listening. Be tuned into your body when you leave this. Give yourself a little bit of a break to look around, have a glass of water, move a little bit. Because this information, it goes in in an interesting way. It kind of infuses into the cells. So be gentle on yourself. Be gentle on the people around you. Um, thank you for being here again. And thanks to Crystal for popping all these links in. We will see you next time. Thanks, everybody.